welcome to The Agenda. I'm Stephen Cole, and this week I'll be separating fact from fiction as we consider the role of the spy on the page and up there on the silver screen. Are fictional spies really anything like their real-life counterparts? We'll be finding out from the best-selling author and former spy, Frederick Forsyth. As the world mourns Sean Connery, we're next for his most famous role, James Bond. As his next screen outing is delayed again, has fiction's ultimate secret agent lost his license to thrill? Ian Fleming's James Bond has sold more than 100 million books, and on the big screen, his 24 official outings have grossed more than $7 billion. But the first fictional spy appeared in print 141 years before Bond's first silver screen outing in Dr. No. In 1821, last of the Mohicans author, James Fenimore Cooper, wrote The Spy, a tale of neutral ground, a tale of conflict and espionage between military and guerrilla forces during the American Revolution. And ever since, some of the world's top authors have dipped their pens into spy fiction. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Rudyard Kipling, Graham Greene, John Buchan and Joseph Conrad, all adding to the canon. But it was the Second World War which really kick-started a new wave of spy films and novels, including the books of the first major female spy novelist, Helen McInnes. Her first book, published in 1939, was Above Suspicion, the tale of an anti-Nazi husband and wife spy team. And after that global conflict, the Cold War provided the perfect backdrop for fictional spies and a great setting for authors like Ian Fleming, John le Carre and Frederick Forsyth. And in the 21st century, more high-tech spies have dominated, with Robert Ludlum's amnesiac CIA assassin Jason Bourne giving Mr Bond more than a run for his money at the box office and the bookshop. On the page and on screen, it's all about glamour, danger and excitement. But is that really how spies operate in real life? Well, given the number of spy authors, including former MI5 boss Dame Stella Remington, who worked in intelligence operations before they ever put pen to paper, maybe fact and fiction aren't that far apart. So the fictional spy has been with us for several centuries, but just how realistic is the portrayal of espionage up there on the big screen, uh, or on the page, of course? Well, a man who really does know is Frederick Forsyth. He's the best-selling author of The Day of the Jackal, The Odessa File, and The Fourth Protocol, amongst many others. As well as selling more than 70 million books worldwide, he's also worked closely with Britain's secret intelligence service, MI6. I sat down with him at his home, just outside London, to find out more. You lived through the Cold War in Europe. Yeah. This is the time in British crime fiction that spy fiction, if you like, was at its height. Why was spy fiction so readable then or so uh, popular? Two reasons, I think. One is it's a, it's a British tradition. We began years ago with the shit, you know, the Riddle of the Sands and um, the Lady in White and so on. We began that genre. Um, everybody else has copied us one way or another. Um, and I think that but the, because in the Cold War it was a subject of daily interest. Your papers were full of Russia doing this, Russia doing that, the East, East Bloc doing this, the Iron Curtain doing this and so on. So people were interested. Um, they're less interested now because they don't perceive the, th the threat. Back then the threat was very perceivable. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, you have to go back two generations. Um, so, there are, I mean, 60% of the British population were not alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis or the assassination of Kennedy a year later. And, but then it was visible to all of us. Well, the, we, we had clear enemies uh, in the form of the Soviet Union uh, and its arm, the KGB. And so it was very present to us. Now it's more remote, and therefore I think the interest is less. How accurately is espionage, or was espionage, re reflected in fiction? Well, I mean, before, I think before Le Carre, he was the pioneer. Before Le Carre, probably not very accurately, 
Eric Ambler did a bit, you know, but it was it was um, all supplies were gentlemen, were Ashenden, and they were Somerset Maugham, and uh, and he uh, <laughs> Eric like broke the mould by bringing in Alex Limas. Um, um, and, and dropped it to the street. Uh, the, Limas was, was who? Was it, well, he was in The Spy Green from the Cold. Um, which, which was, was John Le Carre's. It early. was his third book, but it was his big breakthrough. Um, and I think a very high fine spy novel. Um, and he, it, he sort of didn't portray it in any way as glamorous or um, bondish with you know uh, men going around pulling out Walter P. P. K. pistols and Shooting agents, shooting rival agents, or anything like that. Um, he he portrayed it, portrayed it rather as it was, which was very secret, very hidden, somewhat grubby, um, about deception and betrayal, um, uh, and basically about about. I mean, I mean, this story behind Spider Man: The Girl was the the destruction of a very dangerous rival. Um, uh, the, uh, in inside the, the East German secret police, um, and to destroy him by discrediting him in, in the eyes of his superiors. So a very um, sort of tortuous novel, um, but it, it set the it set the mold for all the Len Daytons and um, and the others. Um, I came along later, but I didn't start with espionage. I started with an assassination attempt, followed by Odessa, which was the exposure of a German mass murderer followed by mercenaries in Africa. I didn't actually get to espionage until novels five or six. So I was a late cover, very much so. But it was, I say, of, it was very, very germane and very contemporary. How much of your experience and what you saw went into those novels uh, that you wrote about spying? Well, quite a lot, quite a lot. I had contacts in, in that world whom, to whom I could go for advice and guidance, and sometimes I would, I'd ask for a meeting. Uh, never at um, either Century House, which was the house before Vauxhall Cross, never there. Um, but usually in a, in a, a restaurant somewhere. Um, and I would say, look, I have in mind just to write this, this and this. Uh, what do you think? And somebody he would say, mm, not yet. It's still, it's still covered. Other times he'd say, yeah, it's usable. You can use it. Um, I would sometimes invent, as I thought, uh, an incident. In the, would go into the book um, and be rewarded by being told, well, actually something very similar actually happened, and you can use it. So it's great. So fact and fiction blurring. Fact and fiction blurring. And in that world, they can blur because strange, strange things happen. There's what um, James Jesus Angleton called a world of smoke and mirrors. As a, an author of, of fiction, based on some ideas and some experiences you've had as a journalist at Reuters and uh, in East Germany. Are you being deceitful in creating a sort of romantic idea of a spy? Not just you, but I mean other authors. Deceitful? Um, ah, that's a good one. I, I wouldn't go on, I don't know. One is trying to entertain, basically. I mean, that's the, the role of the storyteller. Uh, storytellers go back an awful long way. Uh, the, the oldest profession of the world is not prostitution. <laughs> it's telling stories. And so one trying to tell us an interesting uh, story that the reader will be, I don't know, fascinated by. Um, if I thought I was possibly going to transcend something to do with the, the nation's, this country's security, then I would uh, ask for advice. But otherwise, no, I'm free to say what I wanted. How would you describe the essential qualities of a good bad spy. I mean, narcissism has to be one of them, I suppose. I'm not certain. That there, because, because, you know, if, if, if there was one single type, then one might say, well, there are rules to describe this type. I don't think there is one single type. They're, they're all different. Um, they don't have anything in common? Virtually not. You know, the capacity to deceive, um, and a talent to deceive, and a taste for deception, probably uh, common. Is the day of the spy, therefore, a little bit dated? Because what you're talking about now is um, uh, military intelligence, electronic intelligence, yeah. drones, a completely different world to the single it man is. going over the wall in a yeah. carry novel. I think that's probably true, that uh, of all the intelligence meeting information gathering going on, most of it now is hyper-tech. It's either... Um, eavesdropping um, 
or photographing either from space or from long range, or the drones, which are providing a huge quantity of information about particularly terrorism in the Middle East. They're constantly patrolling overhead, unseen, but all seeing, uh, and controlled by a pilot in, for God's sake, Creech. In <laughs> uh, Nevada or something. Air Force Base Creech in Nevada. <laughs> so if you're writing a novel in 2020, 2021 yeah. about espionage, what would the focus be? Oh, I think it would have to be the, the, the computer. I mean, it would have to be. Um, because I can't see James Bond on a laptop. No, no. I don't think anybody would go to bed with go to bed with anybody either. <laughs> Nobody go and see the film, would they? No. But I mean, Bond, Bond was was ludicrous in the sense of you know coming going and finding the chief um, sort of bad guy who's going to spectre who's going to destroy the world or something, and to be greeted by a good evening, Mr. Bond, we have been expecting you. I said, that's a secret mission? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Lasted seven seconds. <laughs> no, that... that uh... <laughs> but you must have enjoyed the Bond films. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, great fun. But I have nothing to do with espionage. Has the spy then had its day? He or oh, no. she? No, I don't think so. It goes back to the Bible. You know, I mean, I mean Gideon and his Midian, the war against the Midianites, uh, he started with a, uh, an expedition to uh, spy on them. So no, it will have to go on because, I mean, it is just simply vital for a powerful nation like ours um, to know in advance what is being plotted and planned against it. And that's counterintelligence. The only way to do that, or one of the two ways to do it, is to go and invade the, 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 the enemy's secret fortress and find out. Fact and fiction, yeah, coming together beautifully. Very close, yeah. Well, they, some some stuff was very close to, to fact, because let's face it, the facts best. I mean, if, that, if you can say, well, that really happened, um, it's even more convincing that I made it up. So there's the, the skill of the journalist and the writer coming together. Well, that's it. That's where the the, the journalism came in. I, looking back, I, I could never have been the writer of what I wrote without the years in journalism taught me a lot, and particularly um, research, which is what journalists are supposed to do, find out what's going on, what's really going on, go, go past the political lies and distortions and uh, sort of um, the, the cover-ups, try and get at the real truth. Um, and if you spend a, a career in journalism doing that, you can switch quite simply and say, well, I'm going to do it now, but I'm, when I get all this, I'm going to write a dispatch. But an extra long one, 350 pages dispatch. <laughs> but, but I'm going to just invent a bit. So I invented a bit. I mean, Jack, Day of the Jackal, yeah, it was, the goal was real. You know? That was the big hit. It was my first break. And I thought, well, if you're, why call the president of France in 1963 Dupont? Everyone knows it's Charles de Gaulle. And everyone knows the OAS tried to assassinate him. So, I used real characters in um, fictional conversations with fictional characters. So you couldn't tell whether this guy was true. You knew that guy was true. <laughs> he was real. But you didn't know whether perhaps the fellow he was talking to was real. No, because he wasn't. He was invented. You make it sound straightforward, but it's more difficult than that. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it. It's, it yes, it can be a bit torturous. Perhaps I have a, a weird mind. I don't know. <laughs> Still to come here on the agenda. If we don't do this, there will be nothing left to save. Time to die. Can the gentleman spy 007 survive in a Me Too world? Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now.
world has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. Welcome back to The Agenda. By now, we should all have been able to enjoy James Bond's 25th official big screen outing, No Time to Die, but the pandemic has delayed its release to April next year. Nevertheless, what does the future really hold for Bond and for all fictional spies? Joining me now are Penny Fielding, Professor of English Literature at Edinburgh University and organiser of Edinburgh's annual Spy Week, and Dr Monica Germana, author of the book Bond Girls, Body Fashion and Gender. Um, welcome to both. Penny, where does James Bond fit into the canon of spy fiction? Now he's become so iconic that it's hard perhaps for us to think about when he made his entrance uh, in the 1950s uh, after the war. Uh, 1953 was the first Bond novel, Casino Royale. Um, and it's very much a post-war novel. So we, all the things we associate Bond with now, all the luxury goods and the cocktails and uh, the food that he eats, um, those were luxuries in the 1950s. So Bond kind of bursts on the scene uh, after the war with all these uh, exciting, uh, luxurious goods. And he also provides a kind of tourist route through Britain and through the world uh, after the war. And, and, Monica, how did James Bond, do you think, come about? He seems very much a, a creation of Ian Fleming's time. Absolutely. Uh, as Penny was saying, um, he is the product of um, a very distinctive post-war climate. Um, the 1950s, we tend to think of uh, as a decade of um, gender conservatism, where women who had got a degree of emancipation during the 1940s and then in many ways replaced men in factories and any kind of positions that men previously occupied had to go back to their homes and become again wives and homemakers. Um, nevertheless, I think the night of the 1950s is a much more complicated era whereby masculinity is in a state of crisis. Um, veterans come back home from the front, often wounded both psychologically and physically. And Bond is precisely that man. He is wounded from the start, if you read Casino Royale or view the 2006 uh, film adaptation, you'll know that um, the character's um, um, debut is marked by a very uh, dramatic ordeal. So he represents a kind of masculinity which on the outside represents um, outward confidence, um, hyper-masculinity, you could say, strength, virility, but under his clothes, so to speak, is a very scarred body. And uh, Penny, he's, he's not fantastically realistic, is he? But does that really matter? Uh, or, or isn't it all really a question of spinning a good yarn? Well, that certainly became the case in the films, particularly with the Roger Moore films. Kind of strangely, um, Fleming thought that Bond was quite realistic. Uh, he, he, he thinks that the background that he provides uh, Bond with is quite real. He uses the term verisimilitude, you know, the idea of realism in fiction. Um, and I think that's partly shown in the extraordinary detail that Fleming gives us in the novels uh, about uh, you know, the cars, the cocktails. We learn in Casino Royale that um, the martini bond drinks, not at all <laughs> what we come to expect from the films. Um, uh, and the 1950s were also a decade of literary realism, so-called angry young men. A very famous novel then in the 1950s was John Brain's Room at the Top, which is about a young working class lad who aspires to... Uh, know, the, the, the wealth and the success that the post-war decade uh, was offering. He has an Aston Martin, uh, or he rather admires someone else who has an Aston Martin. Bond, in the uh, early novels, has a, a 
Bentley, between 1930 and Bentley. So although the, the legend of Wilde has become uh, extremely exaggerated, kind of hyper-masculine, comic, comedic, particularly with the, uh, the Moore films, perhaps less so with more recent Daniel Craig films, uh, that's not quite what Fleming wanted. Uh, he, he thought that these novels were uh, more real, perhaps, than uh, looking back we expect them to be. Yeah. Monica, you've written a book about Bond girls uh, in the age of Me Too. Um, is that a problem? Well, not for me, <laughs> obviously. It's not for me either, Bond... but for some it could be. <laughs> um, the term Bond girl has been uh, the object of some kind of controversy. I, I don't think the word girl in itself is problematic. It is problematic only if you interpret it in a kind of sexist way. Um, but there are many other ways in which the girl word can be used. For example, you know, you can talk about girls night out or girls power. And in both of those uh, instances, the term girl signifies playfulness and a way of um, inhabiting and performing gender that is not strictly um, abiding to the rules of patriarchy. And I see that uh, Bond girls do exactly that. And um, besides the fact that uh, they can be young women, uh, in, especially in the books, but girlhood is more of a state of mind, I would say, more in tune with the notion of youth quake that um, really was ushered in in the 1960s where the cinematic bond also started. So it, it really reflects an idea of independence, resilience, and um, a really more gender fluid way of thinking about uh, womanhood, I would say. It, 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 um, is, it, is it really sort of unusual to have a bond girl? Girls, Bond spies, because the only the two names I could think of are female spies are Mata Hari and the sort of cartoonish modesty blaze. It's not really been a place traditionally for women spying. It's the sort of secretive man. The, the glamorous world of spying as created and apologized for by John Le Carre. Well, there were actually, historically, there were actually many women, many female agents who, who worked uh, in the Second World War, and some of whom um, Fleming certainly had at the back of his mind when he was writing the character, for example, of Vesper Lind. So I don't think it's strictly true that historically there haven't been any female agents. And certainly what Fleming brings about is a female a range of female characters who are not just eye candy although beautiful they certainly are um they but they are they have their own missions and often they they are either helpful to bond as sidekicks in in action or they can be villains and as villains they will be you know, placing hurdles and obstacles. And we see that in many of the most memorable uh, female characters in the films from, um, say, Fiona Volpe in uh, Thunderbolt to um, um, uh, Xenia Onatop in Golden Eye. Both of those characters um, do um, somehow give Bond a very hard time while enjoying uh, the pleasures that he may afford them. On that theme, Monica, Jane Bond, the name's Bond, Jane Bond. Uh, is that going to happen? Well, interestingly, in the next uh, instalment of the franchise, whenever that's going to be released, we are going to have a female 007, not a female Bond as such, but a female 007 um, played by uh, Lashana Lynch. Um, and I think it is very interesting to have more interesting female roles who have you know, import an important part in the mission alongside James Bond. Nevertheless, I think James Bond as a character, I think should remain James Bond. He is a character in his own right. And even if he has flaws, he may be sexist, he is patronizing. In the past, he was certainly um, racist. Um, but we can, we can still deal with that if we have characters on screen um, who play strong roles who question and challenge those aspects of his character. And, and Penny, what, what about spy fiction in general? Uh, how healthy is that in 2020? Uh, is, is there still room for spy fiction? Oh, very much so. In fact, spy fiction is kind of having a, a renaissance at the moment uh, with uh, 
partly with female spy novelists like uh, Lauren Wilkinson, uh, Ali Munro, August Thomas, uh, and most famously Stella Remington, you know, who was head of MI5 and now has a career as a spy novelist. Uh, the, the spy novel is being reinvented, um, particularly with the novels of Mick Heron, who has created you know, a kind of alternative world of spies who've been pushed out of the glamorous world of, uh, <laughs> you know, James Bond type secrecy and hang out <laughs> in an It's offshoot very real, of... the world of the Mick Heron spy, isn't it? It's very grubby. Yeah, yeah, Slough House. Uh, and the, the spies who are banished there are called the slow horses. But because they are so um, idiosyncratic and distinctive, uh, they are allowed to break the rules, or they do break the rules. So they get things done that uh, other spies perhaps can't. So th even though the Cold War's over, you both think there is room for spy fiction for the future? Definitely. The spy novel isn't a product of the Cold War. It really starts in the 1890s uh, with uh, kind of invasion narratives. Everyone is terrified the Germans are going to invade. Um, and then you have novels like uh, John Buchan's spy series. Uh, so it's not dependent on the Cold War. In fact, it's not really dependent on any, any wars. And I'm absolutely certain that uh, it will continue to develop and evolve. Yes, I mean, I would say and the way James Bond um, has evolved as well as a character, um, and, you know, in, in the literary novels to begin with, the conflict is mainly between, you know, the West and the Soviet bloc. But then it evolves even in Fleming, in, in the, the enemy evolves into a more global um, organization in the form of Spectre, which is what we see in the films. So it really is about global geopolitics. And so in that respect, it will always be relevant. There will always be some kind of conflict, sadly, in the world. And But as Benny says, it's not, nothing, it's not necessarily to do with conflict, but more to do with um, the the very interesting and thrilling world that is um, international espionage and uh, international politics. Exactly right. Monica Germana and Professor Penny Fielding, many thanks to you both for joining us on the agenda. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. The name's Bond, James Bond, is perhaps the most famous cinematic introduction to a spy in either fiction or celluloid history. Bond is the man who is licensed to kill for his country, and everyone knows he likes his martini shaken, not stirred. But is Bond still relevant as a spy today? In the old days, super spies on film had to face a different sort of jeopardy. No mobile phones to call for help, no tracking systems or drones, and little electronic surveillance of any use. But Time has caught up with Bond and his ilk. Most real-life spies can now find all the information they need without leaving their desks. And the use of biometric border controls makes it trickier for spies to travel under an alias. Facial recognition and fingerprints are harder to fake than passports. All of which poses real problems for authors and screenwriters when looking to come up with the next global franchise. Watching your hero or heroine, clicking through pages on a laptop for an hour and a half on screen or 300 pages of a novel just isn't going to cut it as an entertaining experience. But, as Frederick Forsyth told me, the joy of a fictional spy story is that while there needs to be a kernel of truth at the heart of the story, all we really want is a gripping tale that keeps us on the edge of our seats. So long as the world needs a hero, Bond is always going to be relevant. Coming up on a future agenda, we'll ask whether the world is in danger of running out of clean water. Don't forget, for more agenda content, you can visit our website or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. But for now, from me, Stephen Cole, and all the agenda team here in London, it's goodbye.